Hey everybody, welcome back. It's Jack here, bakewithjack.co.uk, bringing you the first bread making tip of 2017. Happy New Year! Um, today's bread tip is not really about bread, it's about soda bread. And soda bread is a little bit halfway between bread and a scone. It's not true bread in that it's not raised, risen by yeast. Uh, it is risen by bicarbonate of soda, that's why it's called soda bread. Not to be confused with sourdough bread, which is the king of yeasted breads, although we don't put yeast in it. It's a long story, we'll talk about that another time, but soda bread is what we're gonna do today. Soda bread is a quick, easy bread that you can do super fast, mix it up, chuck it in the oven. The bicarbonate of soda has to react with something acidic, and the acidic acidity that we use comes from uh, the buttermilk, which is the liquid element in the recipe. And this is how it's done. Okay, I've got everything weighed in my bowl, all ready to go. Plain flour here, wholemeal flour, oat flour, which is essentially oats whizzed up in a food processor, don't worry about buying it. You've got salt, bicarbonate of soda, soft brown sugar, and my buttermilk is here. Now, keep some flour handy in case you need to dust it up. You might need to do that if it gets sticky. I've got a nice scraper here to help me out along the way. This I'm gonna use for mixing in all the liquid, cutting it in, mixing it up, scraping it out of the bowl and all that stuff. It's really, really handy. Now, as soon as that buttermilk goes into the dry mix, it's gonna hit that bicarbonate soda and it's all gonna start frothing up. So at that point, you've gotta be quite swift in mixing it up, getting it out and shaping it. First things first, whisk. Get yourself a whisk and whisk all your dry stuff together till it's nice and evenly distributed throughout. Get rid of that, we don't need that anymore. Now, buttermilk goes in. Boom, all in one go. Get it all out with your scraper or a spatula or something, whatever you can use. Okay, next mix it all together with your scraper. Get it in there, move the bowl, move the scraper, mix it all together. If you want to, you can cut it in like this. Expose a bit of that dry stuff, get that moisture in there. Mix it all up, put it on the table for good measure, that's fine. Mix it up nice and quickly, it's coming together really fast. Give it a little squeeze up, cut, cut, cut. Until it starts coming together, get underneath. There's always a dry bit sneaky underneath, hiding away. Cut it all in, like this. As it comes together, yes, get it out onto the table. Squeeze it up into a nice ball, like that. Get rid of that bowl. Now, you don't want to overwork it, just give it a little a little bit of a knead, not too much work, just enough to make it nice and round. You see it's got some dodgy cracks in it and stuff like that and bits and bobs like that, but that's absolutely fine. What you don't want to do is work it too much. Make it into a nice ball, like this, pat it, shape it up. Get it onto a tray. Like that. Flatten it slightly. It's going to puff up, remember. Big cross in the top like this with a knife. I've not gone right to the bottom, just about halfway. Now that goes straight in the oven. We don't wait for this one. We don't have to wait, wait and let, let it rest and prove up or anything like that because there's no yeast. It's already puffing. As soon as it hits the heat of the oven, it's going to puff up like crazy, like a great big scone. I'm going to get it in right now. 200 degrees. I'm going to give it 30 minutes and have a look and a double check back with you in a minute to let you know how we get in okay, on. Okay, here she is. Fresh from the oven. Properly rustic soda bread. Get that underneath. While it's still hot, I'm just going to paint it with some melted butter and let that all soak in. Oh yes. Keep it nice and moist. Delicious. And just let it cool, let it, let it cool for a while, otherwise it can be a bit doughy when you eat it. That took 40 minutes in my oven, which is quite, which is all right, it's not top of the range oven by any means, but it is fan assisted electric oven, so it's got some oomph to it. 200 degrees, nice 40 minutes in there. That's just perfect. Nice and crisp on the outside. I'm gonna let that sink in, let it rest up now for about half an hour or so. Let it cool down a little bit. 
And yeah, there you go. There you have it. Soda bread, super fast, done and dusted in an hour. Easy peasy. And you can use it like you would do any bread. You can slice it and toast it if you want to. And you can um, put it with some nice soup this time of year, some stew or something like that. And uh, really well worth doing. There you have it. That's how to make soda bread. I'm going to put the recipe underneath somewhere or up above if you're watching this on Facebook it will be there somewhere you can click a link and go and make your own if you like if you do let me know how you get on and if you encounter any issues along the way let me know how you get on um, please click like if you like this video share it with your pals and uh, I look forward to seeing you next week send me your bread making questions and I answer one every single Thursday uh, I look forward to it next week see you soon Hey home bakers, it's Jack here at bakewithjack.co.uk bringing your weekly bread making tip and today is a good one. <laughs> it's a good one, yes. Um, today we're going to talk about that hollow sound, right, that everybody speaks about. It's the signal that your loaf of bread is ready, is fully baked out of the oven. Give it a little tap, tap, tappy and it will sound hollow. I've got two loaves over there. One of them is not done, one of them is done. I'm going to tap them both and we're going to see what the difference is so you get a real clear idea of what you're listening for and what you're waiting for to tell you that your bread is ready. And I do hope this translates well over video. I hope we can sound, uh, see the difference really nice and clear. And uh, yeah, let me go get them. Hold on. Okay, here's one I made earlier that is not ready. Okay, ready? Can you hear that? It's like a dull thud. Thud, thud, thud. I'm gonna go get the other one. So here's the one that is done. <laughs> oh, I hope you can hear this. Ready? Got that? Can you hear the difference? I hope so. It's like a hollow, it's like a hollow sound. That's what they say. It's like a hollow sound, it like echoes. It echoes inside. Like a bit more of a drum like, instead of a thud, it's got a bit more like resonance to it, I suppose. There is one more point I want to make on this uh, is your bready ready thing, is your bready ready thing, is that when you do the first tap, when it's not done, you get like a wobble from underneath. If you hold it in your hand like this, tap it on the top, you can feel like almost like a vibration coming from the middle. And uh, if that happens, it's not quite there yet. If you keep going, keep tapping after a while, you won't get that wobble anymore. It'll be nice and firm inside. Yes, that happened. Looks like the other one's done. Uh, you won't get that wobble inside and that's when you'll know that it's ready. Um, thank you so much for watching this video. I really appreciate you turning up every single Thursday for a bread making tip. And if you sent your question in, uh, if you have a question, send it in. And I'll get on top of it in another video. I hope this helps you to determine when your bread's ready or not. I hope you can hear the difference. And if you are worried at any point, just tap it when you know that it's probably not done and tap it again afterwards. You only need to do that once and then you know what you're listening for next time. Thank you very much. I appreciate every single one of you and I look forward to seeing you next week. Bye-bye. Hey, home bakers, it's Jack here at bakewithjack.co. Dot UK bringing your weekly bread making tip every single Thursday and today I want to talk about slashing stuff up, slashing your dough, making the nice decorative cuts in the top of it uh, to allow a little bit more expansion in the oven and to give it deliberately weakened areas for it to burst and you get that super crispy crunchiness inside those gaps which is the ultimate. It's quite tricky to achieve in your oven at home but it can be done with a little bit of trial and error and practice. It can be done but either way whether that rupture, that burst happens or not, uh, it's going to be delicious and it's going to look wicked anyway. Um, fun fact, in the olden days there used to be a communal oven in the village uh, so I'm told I wasn't there and uh, people used to bring their loaves down to bake in the communal oven and in order for them to recognise their own loaf they'd slash a little trademark on the top so they'd know when it came out they'd be able to recognise which one there was and they could take their own loaf home. Uh, let's do it, I've got a bloomer to slash, let's slash it up. 
So this is a bloomer loaf that I have ready, proved and ready for the oven. It's very, very soft. Now I'd recommend, if this is your first time slashing something, don't wait till this stage. Just go like halfway in the proving or till it's nearly done, it's still got a bit of firmness left. Cut it really nicely and then you can allow it to a little bit more time to puff up a little bit more before it goes into the oven. But that's like that's the safest way basically because if it's too delicate and you cut it, you might lose all the air uh, before it goes into the oven, which is bad news. Keep it a little bit firm, slash it, and if it doesn't go anywhere, if it's quite happy, you can let it prove up a little bit the rest of the time before you put it into the oven. This one's quite delicate, so I'm just going to go for it. A little bit of flour everywhere and rub it all over nicely, really gently, but everywhere, because it looks really nice, yeah? You get the white bit with the flour on top, and then you get the bit where you've cut it with no flour, and it all puffs up and looks really, really lovely when it comes out of the oven. Uh, small cuts are a bit safer than big cuts. If you don't want to go to a big cut straight away, nice small cuts look lovely too. I'm going to do a combination. I'm just going to freestyle it, and let's see what happens. This is a grignette, this is what I'm using, it's basically a baker's razor blade on a plastic handle. It's got a curve in it, you can get straight ones too, but this is quite cool. It's brand new so it's nice and sharp, and I've got to be real swift with it, real swift with the cutting, get your fingers miles out of the way because it is well sharp. Right, here goes. Woo, big cut. There we go. Slashed. Sliced, it's okay for a minute. I might just leave it for a minute because it's not going anywhere. It might just open up a little bit before I pop it into the oven. Let's leave it for a bit and get it into the oven. So there you have it, the loaf is baking. Uh, that's how you slash a loaf of bread and I'm gonna cut to a nice picture of it finished. Now, pretty cool, hey? So, um, <laughs> TV magic. Uh, you can slash whatever you want, a baguette, a roll if you want to, go crazy. I use this, it's called a grignette, G-R-I-G-N-E-T-T-E, -G -E, grignette. Uh, you can buy one from my website if you want to, the link's underneath. And um, yeah, thank you so much for joining me. We do this every single Thursday. Um, let me know your baking disasters. Let's try and get on top of them. If there's one thing that's playing in your mind trying to figure out in your bread making, send me a message on here in the comments and um, I will get on top of it. I'm here every single week and I look forward to seeing you next Thursday. Bye bye. Hey home bakers, it's Jack here at bakerjack.co.uk bringing your weekly bread making tip every single Thursday. Um, last week I spoke to you about how to slash a loaf of bread using a grignette. Uh, now, after that, a couple of questions came in, one from Tina from YouTube, thank you very much, uh, asking me, are slash patterns particular to certain shapes of loaves? Okay, uh, and the answer is, uh, not really. Uh, probably, there will probably be somebody who can tell you that a baguette is not a baguette unless it's got 9, 10, 11 cuts on it, I don't know. Uh, but it's not really an issue. There are a few guidelines to follow um, that I want to talk to you about today. And then I'm going to put together a little montage. I've done some slashing the other day. I put together a little montage for you, um, stick a little bit of music on it, of some ideas for you to use your grignette and get the best out of it, and um, just to make some different patterns on the top of your bread, your loaf, your baguette, or whatever it is. I'm going to do a little montage after. The aim of the game is to get the cuts to open up. That's the aim of the game, right? And there's a few things you can follow to make sure that happens, okay? Um, the one thing is, if you're slashing a baguette, if you've got a baguette like this, right? And if you're slashing it horizontally, uh, diagonally, which is natural to do, you slash it diagonal, slash like that, um, to get those nice cuts to open up on the middle, um, the main thing to follow is, if your baguette is this way and you're doing it diagonally, try not to go this sort of diagonal. Lean towards the, like, a long ways, along that baguette this way. Because if you've rolled that baguette up really nicely, making it nice and tight and building that tension on the top, on the outside, um, the best way to get the cuts to open is to cut it long ways, horizontally, so that, um, so that it, that tension will then naturally open up because that's where the tension is going when you rolled it up. And if you have my look at my video on how to shape a loaf of bread, you sort of get the idea. You roll it up nicely, 
building the tension on the outside so when you slash it, the cuts will open if you're going across the way that the tension is building, if that makes sense. So if your baguette's like this and you do it diagonally, go towards long ways instead of across ways really to get it to open up nicely. Three things you can do when you bake it to make sure it opens up real nice. First thing is crank your oven up to the maximum. Crank your oven up to the maximum, you put your bread in it, and then get that initial heat, gives you maximum oven spring, which is this, in the oven. Maximum oven spring because of the maximum heat, and then you can turn it down and continue to bake it on a lower heat um, to make sure it's baked through without burning the top. The second thing is, you can use a baking stone, and you may have seen people making pizzas, cooking pizzas on a hot stone inside of the oven, or inside of those real heavy, deep uh, pans that's really hot, heated up inside of the oven. Um, because of the instant heat on the bottom, again, whoosh, maximum oven spring, you get that big uh, bounce, that big growth when you put it in straight away, get those cuts that open really nice. And the third thing is steam. I did a video on steam to have a chat about it before. Um, maximize the steam in your oven. Get steam in there somehow. The best way I find is to have a hot tray on the bottom shelf. Pour in a kettle full of hot boiling water. Uh, be careful and uh, that'll create big loads of steam before you shut the door with the bread inside to make sure it steams up really nice. That means the combination of the high heat, uh, baking stone, maximum oven spring, and the, uh, the humidity in there, the steam in there, allowing the crust to uh, stay softer for longer, making it rise for longer. That's how you get the cuts to open up real nice. That's my top tips. And here comes a little montage for you, a little bit of music to help you out, to give you some ideas of what to do uh, with your grignette. So there you have it, a couple of ideas to help you out, slashing up your bread, making it look properly artisan like it came out of a baker's shop window. Um, if you uh, want to get a grignette from me, you can. Shout out to Stephen Carr, thank you very much for getting your grignette and sending me a nice picture of your loaf. Uh, it looked wicked, well done, thank you very much. Um, yeah, get your grignette from my website if you want one. I'll put a link underneath. And make sure you're swift with it. Uh, you've got to be gentle with your dough and uh, it'll come out really, really lovely, really, really nice, and um, send me a snap. I wanna see it. If you've got any bread making question of your own, please let me know, stick it underneath in the comments wherever you like. Uh, let me know if there's something you're struggling with, something you're confused about, something's not going quite right. Let me know, and if your bread is a great success, let me know that too, because that's wicked. Um, lovely, thank you very much, have a nice Thursday. I look forward to seeing you next Thursday for another bread making tip from me. Um, see you soon. One more thing to mention before we go. Slash your bread depending on how firm or how delicate it is when it goes into the oven. As your loaf rises and rises, it becomes more and more and more delicate, and the more delicate it is, the less 
is better, okay? Less is more. When it's more delicate, smaller cuts, less cuts, because if you put a big one down the middle, it's got risk of losing all that air out of it and collapsing down completely. Uh, if it's a little bit firmer, you can get away with all these snazzy designs that you see, um, little intricate cuts or a big one down the middle or that sort of thing when it's a bit firmer. Less is more, the more delicate it becomes. And that's it from me. See you next week. Have a good one. Hey, home bakers, it's me. It's Jack at bakewithjack.co. Dot UK bringing your weekly bread making tip every single Thursday. I'm here at the cookery school in Aberdeenhammer in Surrey where I do my bread making classes. We just finished one. I just thought I'd record this quickly while it's fresh in my head. And um, today's bread making, bread making tip is all about sort of ratios of flour and water, okay? When you're mixing up your dough, when you're putting the water into the flour for your bread, dough, when you mix it up, Try not to judge it too quickly in terms of like how dry it is, how it might be too dry, it might be too wet, because it might be nice and soft and moist, but floury on the outside leads you to think that it's too dry. Uh, and it might not be. Try and mix it all together first, get it out onto the table so you can feel what, you, what you're doing. And then if there's anything creeps into your mind, like for example today something happened and someone's dough was a little bit dry, was a little bit tight, and they said, oh, I'm not sure about this. And I said, let's mix it up, get it out on the table first, and then we can really see what's going on. Turned out, uh, it was quite dry. Something went wrong in the measuring uh, of the water. Something must have gone wrong somewhere down the line. So it's quite dry, and this is what we did, okay? We got the recipe, um, added up all the quantities in the recipe, the flour, the water, the yeast, uh, there was herbs in there, all the, all the, the olive oil, all the quantity of the recipe in there. Added it all up and got the number of what our dough should have weighed. Then we weighed the actual dough and it turned out that the dough was 53 grams lighter than what it should have been in the recipe. So we knew we could add 53 grams of water is probably what's missing and that's what we did. We put the dough back in the bowl, poured the water in, gave a good squeeze up. When your dough's already a dough, it's quite tricky to get that water in, but you just keep squeezing it with your hands, working it in the bowl, and all the moisture will go into that dough eventually. It all went in, it came out, we needed it, or they needed it, I didn't need it. They needed it nicely, and uh, it came out nice and silky smooth, exactly what it should have been. And that's how we found out what was missing. We thought, well, probably there's moisture missing, weigh the dough, work out what it should have weighed, and the difference, we add the extra water in, if that makes sense. That's what we did, and that's how we fixed it, and it came out looking lovely. Um, so nice one, chaps. It's happened two weeks in a row. That's why I thought I'd, think, I thought I'd talk about this this week, because it's happened twice in a row, two weeks in a row, and uh, that's how we figured it out and got back on track. Um, but again, just double check everything as it's going into the recipe, so you're confident that when you move on, it's exactly like it should have been. But as long as your recipe comes from a trusted source, go with the ingredients. And if there's something in the back of your mind saying, too tight, weigh the difference, add the water in. And that's it. So as always, thank you very much for watching this video. Uh, I hope it's helped you out with the bread making. If there's one thing you're struggling with, one issue you're coming up against, the one thing in your mind you're not quite sure if you're doing it correctly, get in touch and let me know and answer one every single week. Thank you very much. Have a lovely week and uh, I'll see you next time. Bye bye. Hey home bakers, it's Jack here at bakewithjack.co.uk bringing your weekly bread making tip every single Thursday. Today is a nice quick one for you. Um, daily, daily I get asked, why is my bread too heavy? Why doesn't it rise sometimes? Why doesn't it come out like really nice and light and delicious? And the first thing I ask is, are you kneading it with flour? Do you put flour down in the kneading process, right? That's the first thing I ask. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you why, right? When bread rises, yeast makes bubbles to make it rise, okay? But the texture of the bread has to be so. It has to be nicely developed elasticity. It has to have nicely developed gluten strands inside to be able to hold all that gas while it puffs up, right? So with that in mind, that's why we put all the work in. 
That's why we put the work into the dough to develop the gluten nicely. We're making the dough strong so it can hold loads of gas, right? That's why we put the work in. So as long as you've kneaded it for long enough, it should puff up with no issues, right? But the question I always ask is, are you using flour to knead it? And the reason is this, right? You already weighed out your ingredients in the recipe. Flour, water, salt, yeast, and whatever other bits and bobs you want to put in, right? It's already weighed and done, right? And that ratio between flour and water is, uh, is pretty key. Uh, it, you can maneuver it and muck about with it a little bit, but it's pretty key to a certain extent, right? When people need in bread, they're expecting, a lot of the time you're expecting a nice round ball like off the TV, right? Nice round ball off the TV, nice smooth, lovely dough, yeah? And sometimes that happens and sometimes it doesn't, but that depends on which sort of recipe you're using. It depends on the water content in the recipe. It might not happen that way, right? So this is what happens. You get really sticky hands and it's natural to just toss flour all over the place to stop it from sticking. Stop the dough sticking to your fingers, stop the dough sticking to the table to stop it sticking, right? But this is what happens. You need and need and need and need in, another little bit of flour, need and need and need and need in, get sticky, another little bit of flour, rinse and repeat, okay? And all that flour is going into the dough, right? So what then happens is, dough becomes really tight, becomes that nice round ball, and that's where you celebrate and go, yes, I must have needed it enough, right? When in actual fact, what you've done is added a lot of extra flour to the recipe, tightening it up, making it really dry, giving the yeast some real resistance to make those bubbles in the first place because of the tightness of the dough, and it's all unworked flour. You're just tossing in unworked flour, underdeveloped gluten, right? That's why it doesn't rise properly. That's why you bake a brick. So. Just be at ease with the mess. Be at ease with the stickiness on your hands and you'll be absolutely fine. First question I asked, and it's the first thing to tweak. If you have any issues, first thing to tweak. As long as you're using room temperature water, proving at room temperature, and your yeast is okay, it's gonna puff up, right? Unless you've tightened it up with that extra flour. If you're having issues, that's the first thing uh, to go and try. Try that, get back to me. See if it's any better. Um, thank you very much for watching. If you have a question of your own, if there's one thing you're struggling with at the moment, or if there's something new, you want to develop a skill, something new you want to know about, let me know. Videos like this are really easy for me to make where I can have a chat. Practical ones are a little bit more tricky. That's why there's only one every now and again. Um, but there will be more. So. Send me your questions. Thanks for watching, and uh, I'll see you next week, next Thursday. Hey, home bakers, it's Jack here at bakewithjack.co.uk, bringing your weekly bread making tip every single Thursday. Today, I want to talk to you about shaping bread because this has come up a couple of times from a couple of people, one from Andy on Instagram, one from Kim in a class, a couple of other people in a class have mentioned that um, when they're making a loaf of bread, like a round loaf, like a cob loaf or something, and they're proving it on a tray or in a basket, when they turn it out of that basket, or when it's on that tray proving, uh, it spreads sideways instead of being nice and tall and plump. And it's a real shame, and I believe uh, it's down to the shaping technique. And I'm gonna show you, I've got some dough here, I can show you what's going on. And I'm gonna do two different ways of shaping. One is a real nice way to uh, build tension. And it's really important to build tension. We must build tension across the top of the dough. And I speak about this all the time. Uh, I did touch on it on another shaping loaf recipe uh, video. It's all about tension. You've got two sides to your dough. You've got a sticky side and a non-stick side. The top is always non-stick. The underside is always nice and sticky, right? Because the underside is sticky, you can make all your folds and all your joins there, which means they all stick to each other and the seam is hidden underneath. The top of your dough, the non-stick side, is where you build all the tension. You make it real nice and tight across the top. It's almost like there's a thin skin on the outside, nice and elastic, and you tighten up real nice and it holds a real nice shape. I'm gonna show you what I mean, I've got a dough to show you what I mean. 
The second dough, uh, I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna roll it up into some sort of ball and see what happens, right? See which one comes up nice and tall and proud and see which one spreads all over the place. I'm pretty sure I know. And if this is happening to you, this should get to the bottom of your issue as well. I'm gonna get the dough. Okay, so I've made this dough right in this pretty straightforward recipe. Um, it's a standard dough, I've kneaded it, I've worked it, I've let it rest for about an hour. Hour and a half and now it's ready for shaping up, cut it into two pieces, right? I'm gonna do one bit, one piece, I'm just gonna fold it up like this a little bit. I'm just gonna, I can't even do it. I'm just gonna roll it into a ball. Pat it up into a ball shape, like that. I can't even, I can't even do it. I'm just gonna pat it into a ball. Something like that, maybe, I don't know. This is like a, to the extreme example of something that is not the right thing to do, right? So, that will do. I'll leave it on there to prove, right? I'll leave it on there to prove. I'm gonna put a little cloth on the top. You can sit on the side and chill out for a bit. Right, this one I'm gonna show you how to do it. Little bit of flour. Now this dough's already upside down, so the top is underneath, is always non-stick. Always check it's not sticky. Now to make this into a nice tight ball, I'm just gonna take a piece here, this side, put it over towards me like that, stick it down. Give it a little turn, take this pointy bit. Give it a little turn, take this bit, give it a little turn, take this bit. And you can do this over and over. What's that, eight turns? Lost count. Nine, 10, and the more you do it, the tighter it becomes on this side, which is the top now. So, the tighter it becomes, and the trickier it is to pull a big piece, right? I'm just listening to the dough and feeling about what it's telling me, right? And you just take this piece and bring it over, and you can take less and less at a time as it becomes tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter, right? Nice, tight ball, like this. Now, at this point, you can do a little bit of this if you like, just to tighten them up a little bit extra. Try not to go too tight because it'll split on the top and you'll get a big crackle on the top. Get your tray. Now you can see it's nice and tight on the top. It's real responsive and bouncy and strong. And I can confidently put that on a tray, dust with a touch of flour. And that's gonna come up nice and tall and proud, right? Because of that tension on the top. There are loads of ways of doing this, loads of ways, but the tension always is across the top, keeping it nice and tight. It's almost like a, like I said earlier, it's like a skin on the top. It's almost like an elastic -y skin on the top, keeping it nice round ball. So that's that one there. The other one is here and it's spread out already. See how it's spread out already? Just resting for that minute or so. I'm gonna put a cloth on the both, like this. Let them rest for a bit. We'll come back and have a look at them a bit later and see how they're getting on. So your dough's got a structure now, right? After you finish kneading, you're developing that structure, the elasticity, developing the gluten, giving the dough strength and building that structure, right? So that's why it's so important now it's not as simple as just rolling it into a ball and putting it on a tray or putting it in a basket. Um, you really got to treat it in the right way to keep the structure that you built already and tighten it up in the right way so it goes exactly where you want it. Because if you just do roll it all up into a ball, it will go wherever it likes. You have to create some sort of like restriction, I suppose, some sort of boundary so it can only go in one way, which is up, which is nice and tall and proud. That's the aim, we'll check back at these in a minute. Hey, hey, so time has passed. <laughs> Hey, hey, time has passed and my dough's nicely risen and this is the difference between the two, okay? Dough number one, now I just rolled up into a ball, this is what it looks like. It's still gonna be nice. It's still gonna be delicious. All is not lost. It's gonna really puff up in the oven as well. It's just a little bit flat, a little bit skew with, but I got away with it, right? It's not perfect. This is the one where I tightened up the tension on the top, across the top into a nice round ball. And this is what it looks like, here's the difference. Yes, look at that bad boy. It's just been proven on a flat tray and it's how it's shaped. It's nice and proud and round 
and that's going to go in the oven when it's going to get a little bit of a boost as well. It's going to get a bit of that oven spring when it hits that heat uh, and it's going to come up a little bit further which is wicked. Hopefully keeping it nice and round due to that tension and I'm going to put a couple of pictures on here in a minute in a sort of semi-montage for you to see the final baked product. Anyway, I hope this has helped you out. Picture montage is coming right now. I hope this has helped you out. If it helps your loaf come up nice and proud, send me a picture because it never gets old. I love it. Um, you can hashtag me into a picture on Instagram or uh, Twitter, hashtag BakeWithJack, and I will definitely see it and give you a shout out. Or you can send me an email, info at bakewithjack.co.uk. And if you want to make a standard, lovely, simple, delicious daily cob loaf, I've, put, I've resurrected the old uh, recipe from the old website and I've put it onto my new website in the blog section. I'll put a link somewhere here or maybe up there and you can uh, have a little go at it have a little go thank you very much i do this every single thursday uh, get your questions in and let me know if there's anything you're struggling with and i'll get on top of it soon thank you i'll see you next week what's up home bakers and happy thursday it's jack here at bakewithjack.co Dot UK bringing your weekly bread making tip every single Thursday. Today I'm going to answer a question that was asked of me in class and I completely forgot to answer it by the end of the class. I remember when I got home and sent her an email. Uh, it was uh, butter. It was about butter and oil. Adding fat to dough. Because we were doing an artisan class and we made one, two, three, four, four, uh, four five different types of bread, I didn't add any fat or butter to any of them. And I was asked, hey men, why don't you, not like that. So I was asked, Jack, why aren't you adding fat, butter, oil to any of these recipes? And the reason was it wasn't entirely necessary. Oil and butter, any fat that you add, uh, makes everything a bit softer. In the crumb, which is the inside, and the crust, which is the outside. It makes everything a little bit softer. So for focaccia, yeah, olive oil, for burger buns, yes. Butter, keep it nice and soft. Brioche, butter. Eggs as well, slightly different eggs because they provide a bit of aeration as well. But everything makes it really soft and the reason why we didn't use it because everything I wanted to be nice and crusty. Really crusty. Um, like our baguettes, no butter, no oil. Nice and crusty on the outside, that's the aim because it's all very well working really hard for a nice crust, but if you put yourself some butter in and oil in, you just stitch yourself up, it's probably not going to happen. Everything I wanted to be nice and crusty, that's why we didn't use it. Uh, one more thing I was going to mention on the whole thing was... Dun, dun, dun. Keeping quality, right? A little bit of oil or a little bit of butter in a recipe, like my standard loaf recipe, pop a couple of tablespoons of oil in there or a tablespoon of butter or a couple. We'll give it longer keeping quality which is a bit of a bonus. It keeps everything softer for longer, and the way I think about it is because water evaporates, but oil does not evaporate. And that's what goes on in my brain, whether that's scientifically correct or not. Who knows? But anyway, there you go. That's why you add butter or oil, or why you don't add it at all. Um, it's completely up to you. Have a little play around, see what you fancy the best. And let me know how you get on. If this is helpful to you, please let me know. Please give me a little thumbs up if you're on YouTube. And if you're on my website, just say hello, pop in, pop a comment, say hello on social media, and say thank you. If I've helped you out, that would be lovely. Thanks so much for coming and watching me every single week. And if you just popped in today, hey, there's a whole back catalogue of this sort of video on my website. And thank you very much. See you next week. Hey home bakers, it's Jack here at bakewithjack.co.uk where I bring your weekly bread making tip every single Thursday and today is World Book Day. Yes! So what I thought I would do was tell you about three bread making books that I like. Now I don't have a lot of bread making books. I don't have loads of stuff. I'm not the kind of guy who sits down and reads bread making books all day. But uh, here's three that I really, really like that you may want to add to your collection. 
and in no particular order, let's go. So number one is uh, something that I picked up probably 12 years ago, 12 years ago, and it's this. It's Dough by Richard Bertinet, or if you're French, like he is, Richard Bertinet, probably, sorry. Um, anyway, this book is a really good one, right? I picked this up a long time ago, and after I picked it up, I did one of his bread making courses at his lovely school, and it was wonderful. And that was way back in the olden days, in 2007, and um, this one's really cool. Comes with a little DVD, which is always lovely. And what's so cool about this is that it's really accessible. Um, it has like a recipe for a simple dough, and then it goes in to tell you exactly what you can do with that then dough, like this. White dough, and then on the next page, here's loads of things you can then go and do with that dough. So what's really cool is it gives you a little education in a certain specific dough, and then you're sort of free to go and experiment and do what you like with it. It does the same with like adding olive oil, olive oil dough, and everything you can do with that, like for catching all the bits and bobs, and a sweet dough and everything you can make with that. And that's what's really cool about it. It gives you a real nice idea of what you're doing and um, what you need to do with that dough to then make it into loads of different other things, which is very, very cool. One thing to note is that the doughs tend to be quite wet, which for a beginner can be a little bit tricky. However, he has quite a nice, unique way of dealing with a wet dough, a wetter dough, a unique way of working it, kneading it, if you like, um, to be able to deal with it really nicely, which I still use for some doughs if they're particularly wet um, these days. And it's really nice. And on the DVD, it shows you exactly how to do it, so you don't know, so you don't miss out, so you know exactly how it's done. And there's some rather lovely pictures of me inside. Look at this. Oh yes, Bakery Jack, 10 years ago. Check it out. With a rather lovely uh, mullet. For some reason, what was I thinking? Who knows? Anyway, onwards. Okay, book number two, and this is an old one, but a new one for me. I picked this one up at the library, and it is Paul Hollywood. Yes, 100 great Breads, the original bestseller, right? And I thought this was pretty old when I opened it up because, for a couple of reasons. One, because there's a rather young picture of Mr. Hollywood in here, looking rather dashing, arranging dough. And um, also because of the nature of the recipes, right? I went through a period where I'd really like to pick up uh, old books from car boot sales like Mary Berry books and stuff like that. And what fascinated me about those books is that uh, it, the descriptions of what to do was really rather basic. Like it would say, blanch this and put it in here or whatever, but it wouldn't actually tell you how to blanch stuff. It left a lot of stuff assuming that you already knew uh, how to do it, right? And the cool thing about this book is that um, it says copyright 2004, right? Which I'm not an expert upon Paul Hollywood's fame timeline, but that seems like a while ago to me. Now, the descriptions are really rather, not as basic as Mary Berry, obviously, but still quite basic. Like you're talking like this one, it's like just a few sentences long. Do you see what I mean? And stuff like that. So it sort of assumes you already know how to do some stuff already, which is really quite cool. And if you do know, you know, obviously if you watch all my videos, you know how to knead stuff, you know why we do it in the first place, you know what you're looking for, you know you know how to shape stuff up properly. Um, and so, you know, if you've got those things under your fingers, this has got loads of substance in it, a hundred recipes for you to have a go out and play with. It's got like brioche and stuff like that in here. Really cool stuff in really simple terms. And it's really nice, but it's not for the complete novice, complete beginner. Like that's, and I feel like that's the difference between this book and like modern books like this one here. That one. Um, it's like the difference is that this one, bread, which is Paul Hollywood book, is like it real goes from the beginning. It's got pictures of what you need to do and folding and stuff like that. But this one is like more meat and potatoes. It's got some pictures in it of techniques, which is really awesome. But most of it is up to you. It's down to you to figure it out, which is really, I really like that. I really like that. And that's why I'm going to buy one of these and stick it on my shelf because um, I really like that about this one. And it seems, you know, before everything got a little bit fancy, it's just a little bit more robust. And it's all about content. And um, that's, that's why I like it. Book 
number three. Now, if you have been in one of my courses or we've met probably somewhere, um, or you've seen a demonstration, you will know I talk a lot about time, right? If you make bread, start to finish, sandwich loaf in three hours, it's gonna be delicious, right? It's gonna be unbelievable, and in comparison to modern bread, it's gonna be like the holy grail of toast. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like absolutely wonderful. However, when you start, it, it, when you start introducing aspects of time, like making a pre-ferment the day before and adding that to your dough, or making a dough and leaving it to rise slowly, coldly overnight, stuff like this. This is when you unlock an unbelievable flavor and unbelievable texture just by doing nothing, and that's what's so exciting. And that's why I like this. It's called slow dough, and this, if you're on top of bread making, if you're breaking making regularly, and you wanna enhance stuff, you wanna make stuff unbelievable, you wanna take flavor to new levels that you didn't even think existed, this is the sort of thing that you're gonna want because this is all about time. Slow dough, real bread. It's the real deal. And the really cool thing I like about this, as soon as I opened it, was it's got this massive glossary of terms and techniques like this. And it will tell you exactly what you need to do. It says folding, dividing and scaling, covering, you know, why you're covering stuff, stuff like this. This is really gets into the nitty gritty of things. And it's a real education. It's a compilation of recipes from loads of different bakers. Look at those donuts, oh my goodness, who's that? Sam Cutter, mmm, damn! It's like a compilation of loads of recipes that yes, take a long time, but for that time you've got to do like hardly anything and it's gonna be unbelievable and delicious. I've tried a couple of recipes out of this, obviously I haven't done them all, but it's really, really cool. Really nice, that's book number three, four, a bit more technical. So, dough is like nice, accessible, educational. Paul Hollywood's 100 Great Breads is like substance, but you've got to have something up here. And the slow dough, boom, that's when stuff starts getting unbelievable. And these are three books that I like. If you've got a book that you like, let me know about it, because I do like picking up new books, as long as they're good. Ha <laughs> um, ha! Let me know what your favorite bread making book is. Um, and yeah, pop it in the comments box, send me a little message, I am everywhere all the time. Come and find me at bakerwithjack.co.uk. Thank you very much for watching. Happy World Book Day. If you're picking up a new book today, good luck to you. Have a nice day, and I will see you next week uh, for something else. Happy Thursday, home bakers. It's Jack here at bakerwithjack.co.uk, bringing your weekly hashtag bread tip every single Thursday. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about these little babies. Oh yeah, it's a potato. Yes, it's a potato. I'm gonna talk about adding potato to your dough, right? Because it's very cool. If you get some potato, cook it in water or whatever, or like a jack of potato, and mash it up, add that to your bread dough, it's gonna be wicked, seriously. I talk a lot about time in, uh, in my classes. I talk a lot about time and the effect time has on dough and the effect that uh, it brings to the crumb. It brings it a nice moistness, a nice bounce, a really nice texture, and you get a similar effect as you do with time if you add mashed potatoes. If you've got some mash left over, add it into the recipe. You get a real nice bounce. You get a real nice texture inside, super soft. Uh, Nice moisture retention inside as well, which is absolutely delicious. And you get a wicked crust on top of all that, which is pretty cool, if you ask me. Um, I was obsessed for a long time with the rosemary and potato bread recipe. Uh, I'm gonna put it on the blog for you to have a go at as well. I was obsessed for a long time. I was doing it in demonstrations, classes. I was doing it at home and just tucking my way through it with a big lump of butter. <laughs> oh, yes. I was obsessed for a long time with the love and the joy that potato brings to the dough. The only thing worth mentioning, if you're adjusting an existing recipe by adding potato, take some of the water content out. Reason is, it might be a little bit dry at the beginning. It might be a little bit tight, and the same with my recipe as well that you might see. It might be a little bit tight and dry in the beginning of the kneading, but there will become a point where that potato makes everything super wet and if you start off too wet in the first place when that 
switch happens, you're going to have a puddle. So cut down some of the water in the recipe, or you can use my recipe as well if you like. And when that switch happens, you'll be okay. It's a little bit like when you make mashed potato, if you overbeat mashed potato, or if um, in the past I've worked in places where they put mashed potato in a big mixer and mixed it all up with a dough hook or a K beater, just mixed it and mixed it and mixed it until it becomes glue, which is absolutely not cool whatsoever. And that's what happens inside of your bread. It makes it wicked. If you're gonna have a go at the blog one, my rosemary and potato bread, send me a picture, let me know how you got on. Um, send me an email, pop it on Instagram or Twitter using the hashtag bake with Jack and I will see it. Because seeing your breads never gets old. I love it. Send me a picture. And you know what, if it's a complete failure, I wanna see it as well. And we'll get to the bottom of it and we'll sort it out. Thank you so much for watching this video every single Thursday. It's really, really cool that you stop by and if it, this is your first time, a hello to you, hello to you. I hope you've enjoyed it. There's loads of more uh, videos like this on here and um, have fun with potatoes. See you soon. Hey home bakers, it's Jack here at bakewithjack.co.uk where I bring your weekly bread making tip every single Thursday. This week, I wanna to talk to you about pre-ferments. A pre-ferment, which sounds like a complicated thing, but in reality, it is not. Now, a pre-ferment, what it is, is essentially a mix of flour, water, and a little bit of yeast that you leave on the side for some time. And then you add it to your bread recipe and it makes it wicked, right? Pre-ferments go by the name of biga in uh, Italy, Polish in uh, France, I believe. I think that's right. You know when you doubt yourself? Yeah, French, France, Polish. Or here in England, sponge. We call it a sponge. Mix up a sponge. That's what we call it. Uh, that's what pre-ferment is, right? And to give you an example of what's going on, I first have to speak about resting time. When your dough rests, and I did a video on this before, you create amazing flavor, amazing structure, and texture, thanks to the gluten. And so, in a pre-ferment, you're making time. Time makes flavor, structure, and texture. Time does. You do a little bit, when you're needing, but the rest is done by the magic of time. And this cannot be replaced by anything. You can't take the time out of the recipe and put something else in, it doesn't work. So that's what happens when the dough rests. And the longer it rests for, the better. And the, but there comes an issue if you leave it too long, but I spoke about that before and this for another time anyway. So the pre-ferment is a mix. Flour, a little tiny bit of yeast, and water develop an amazing flavor and amazing texture over a period of time that you add to your dough and it makes it wonderful. Okay? So, for example, when you make a ciabatta, you make a real sloppy mix with flour and water and a little touch of yeast, and this develops loads of, develops the gluten really well and makes it real extendable, real elastic -y, right? And that is perfect because the dough, in the end, when you add that pre-ferment to the dough and make the whole dough, is gonna be really super sloppy and it's gonna wanna be really stretchy so you get those big holes and big bubbles and nice flavor two as a bonus and as an example if you want to have a go it's really not a big deal you just mix some stuff up in a bowl and leave it on the side till tomorrow and then you make your dough as normal i did a recipe using the ciabatta principle to make a super focaccia and i called it the super focaccia mm, yeah because it is super and it's on my blog if you want to go and have a look i'll put a link here somewhere it's on my blog and you can have a go at the super focaccia if you want to it's absolutely wonderful, real nice texture, real nice flavor, all down to time. And all that time is locked in to your pre-ferment, or your beaker, or your poolish, or your sponge. Whatever you want to call it, it's a pre-ferment. It makes it delicious, and it makes a wonderful texture and structure. And this has been me, Jack, at Bake With Jack. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for coming and watching my videos every single Thursday. 
If you've got a question of your own, please pop it in here. Send me some sort of something, tweet, Facebook message, Instagram message, put me in your story, whatever you like. Make sure I hear it and I'll get onto it. And I will see you next week. Hey, home bakers, it's Jack here at bakewithjack.co. UK bringing your weekly bread making tip every single Thursday and today I want to talk to you about enriched dough. So what is an enriched dough? An enriched dough is essentially a bread dough enriched with uh, butter and eggs. Um, butter and eggs bring flavour and really nice light texture, right? Any fat that you add to the dough, oil or butter, will make everything really much softer in the crumb and in the crust, right? Much softer. And eggs is fat as well, so when you add eggs, that makes everything softer too, except eggs bring a little bit of lift as well, which is wicked. That's why when you get an iced bun, for example, it's really light and fluffy in comparison to a white loaf of bread that you made. That's the difference, okay? So butter brings wicked flavour and softness. Eggs bring nice softness and aeration as well, which is a bonus, right? So in my class, I did an enriched dough class a couple of weeks ago for the first time. I can't believe it's taken me so long to get one together, but it has, and I did it for the first time a couple of weeks ago, and it went really well, okay? And we did a range of doughs. So we did one sweet dough, and it had um, butter in it, just butter, and we used that to make a babka, chocolate and hazelnut babka, which was delightful. And we also used it to make some pistachio swirl buns, which came out really well. So that was nice and buttery, nice and soft. And then we did butter and eggs, which we used to make hot cross buns. We made hot cross buns, so they came out nice and soft and buttery with a little bit of whoosh, lift as well, because it had one egg in the recipe, right? And then we did the ultimate enriched dough, which is a brioche. Now, brioche uh, liquid content is mostly eggs. It's mostly eggs. In fact, I've seen some recipes where it's completely eggs but it's mostly eggs and a little bit of milk, the recipe that I use. And then it's got loads of butter. For example, if you're making a nice white sliced bread with half a kilo of flour, if you put 15 grams of butter in there, it's enough for a little bit of buttery taste and a little bit of uh, softness as well. In our brioche dough, we only use 300, I think it was 325 or three, probably 375 flour and we put in 180 grams of butter, and that is a lot. That's why brioche is so buttery and so lovely. And to give you an idea of lift, the white sliced loaf, 500 grams of flour, you'll make one nice loaf of bread in the two pound tin. For the brioche, for 375 grams of flour, we made two loaves in a tin, because that's how much lift you get out of those eggs. You get a really wicked puff. And that's why there may be a lot of butter in it, there may be a lot of eggs, a little bit of sugar, but actually, if you get two loaves out of that and have a slice of a loaf, really, it's not that bad really, when you think about it. You're only eating a little bit of it anyway. One more thing to mention on a rich dough is milk. If you replace water, with milk in a recipe, again, high fat content, therefore, softer bread and a little bit of flavour too. So that's what an enriched dough is. There you go. Thank you very much for watching me every single Thursday. It's much appreciated. If you've got a question of your own, stick it underneath in the comments box. And one more thing, can't remember. But yeah, stick it in the comments box underneath. These nice videos like this are really quick and easy for me to make. The practical ones are a bit more tricky, that's why they come up every now and again, but not every single time. But there you go, that's what Enriched Dough is. Thank you so much for being here. See you next week. Hey, 
home bakers, it's Jack here at bakewithjack.co.uk bringing your weekly bread baking tip every single Thursday. And today I'm going to go a little bit crackers for a bit. And the reason I'm saying that is to give you a nice warning. So when the crackers comes out, you're going to be ready for it, okay? Today I want to talk to you about giving up. Bread making is tricky, okay? You need a couple of things in order to make it work. But don't expect it to come out right the first time out. Sometimes it does, and when I'm on Instagram, I see some wicked first bakes, and people saying, first level loaf out of the oven looks amazing, and I love that, but it doesn't always happen, because people don't put that stuff on Instagram when it goes wrong. They just don't. But what I want to talk to you about today is like, is really important to me, right, because I meet a lot of people and I talk to a lot of people about bread, right? And I say to them, hey, have you made bread before? And they say, oh yeah, I tried it. Yeah, you know, five, six, seven, eight years ago, uh, one time, and it came out really bad. And after that, well, I just gave up in the end. But can you imagine? Can you imagine if they got it right, or if they persisted five, six, seven, eight years ago, that's five, six, seven, eight years of amazing bread they could have been eating just from persisting and I think the thing that I like about bread is that it's a skill right and so is everything I think that's why I'm obsessed with it so much because everything is a skill making bread is a skill driving a car is a skill running a business is a skill but you need a couple of things you need knowledge and you need patience and persistence right that's why it's so important and the knowledge is everywhere I share a tip with you every week. I put tips on daily on Instagram, every single day. And you know what, I'm not just talking about me, there's loads of people out there. There's people all over the place putting resources out online to help people get it right. There's stuff everywhere. There's recipes all over the place. And you know what, there's so much of it, like sometimes even I, I look for advice, for business advice, for all other bits and bobs to help me along my journey, along my life, and along creating my business and my world. And there are certain resources that I use, and when I figured this out, that there's knowledge all over the place for free, I overdosed on it completely. I went out looking for it, I found loads of stuff, and it completely killed me because there was stuff all over the place, and it frazzled my brain that, that it was infinite, because it is. So I picked a few people that I follow now for inspiration, um, for advice, and I follow two, three people um, that I really listen to, and that's the way it goes. And all I've got to do now is persist and practice and build up knowledge. And by the way, practice is the same. Like, knowledge is practice. That's what happens. You practice and you get knowledge. But it breaks my heart every single time to hear that somebody's failed and given up because it's so... For a few reasons, actually. Because it's so good, like... Your own bread is so good. It's so cheap if that's a worry as well. And um, the stuff that we buy is awful. I don't like it. I'm gonna do another video on that I think another time because like, I try not to rant too much about this stuff. But it upsets me. That is so awful. I feel, it doesn't upset me. I feel like I'm being hoodwinked. But that's for another day. But the message of the video is today to just persist. You know, if you come up against something that's tricky, let me know, get in touch. Uh, it doesn't come out quite right. You know, in my classes, what I love about it is that there's so many little moments, ping, where the penny drops for somebody. And I can see it on their face, it's amazing. Somebody will come in and every time I ask everybody, have you made bread before? You know, what's your previous experience? Stuff like this, right? Because I need to get to know, get into their mind, see what they've done, see what they need to do and where they want to go and stuff like this to really get the best out of it, right? So. People come and I ask, and they'll say, oh yeah, I do this one recipe, and it always comes out a bit different, or it always comes out a bit heavy, or it always comes out something else, or sometimes it's nice, and sometimes it's not, and all this other stuff, and I say to them, at some point today, I hope, something I say will go, ping, oh yeah, I don't do that, and that's why it's heavy, or oh yeah, I do do that, I put flour down when I need it, and that's why it's heavy, and stuff like this, right? That happens all the time. Those little penny drop moments that just solve the whole issue. And it's so close. It's so close. Um, 
it's such a shame to give up on stuff when you're so close. And I think that's why I like bread, because it's not just about the bread. It's about the process and the learning and the teaching and those penny drops that happen all the time in life, not just when you're making bread. You know, when my daughter was uh, like one years old and she's crawling about the floor and whatever, she didn't stand up on her feet and topple over and go, oh, can't walk. I'm not going to try that again. You know, she got up a lot of times and toppled over a lot of times, but now she's walking, of course. She's three and a half, so she walks about. But she never thought, ah, oh, I can't do that. I'm not very good at walking, so I'm not going to do that anymore. You know, and it's the same thing. I told you it was gonna get a bit crackers today. I told you it was gonna get crackers and if you stayed now, what are we on? Five minutes and 66 minutes? If you stayed this long, well done, because there's a lot of crackers coming out. But you know what, sometimes I feel like when I'm leaving somewhere, I'm leaving a class or I'm leaving a, a course or a private booking or demonstration, there's so much more of me here that needs to come out and I'll drive home with the radio off and I'll just talk rubbish to myself. And this is what comes out. So I'm sharing it with you. Please don't give up. Everybody fails at stuff. I fail all the time. I've got a recipe on now, I'm thinking of a new recipe I thought would be really cool and I'm trying it out, it's not rising. It's been ages, it's not rising. Am I worried? A little bit. No, I'm not, but I'll try it again and then I'll give you something amazing, I hope. We'll see, but everybody fails, it's just the nature of life. Try again. Because once you nail it, it's a wicker feeling. And if you take that skill for life into your life to change your life, that's, all, that's what I want, that's what I want. And they're selfish, I know, but that's what I want. And I want you to tell me about it as well. Let me know. So, if there's anything that's stopping you from making wicked bread, if you're having the same issue over and over, just let me know and get in touch. That's the beauty of 2017. When we're here, I'm looking at my telephone and you're looking at your telephone. Uh, that's the nature of it, I'm here. Let me know. Thank you very much. Sorry for going crackers this week. I'll be back on it next week. And all the crackers is out now for a while. It'll come back around another time. Thanks for watching. See you next week. Hey home bakers, it's Jack here at bakewithjack.co.uk bringing your weekly bread making tip every single Thursday. And today I'm making hot cross buns for a local cafe which is pretty wicked. But it just crossed my mind, something I could talk about today uh, for your weekly bread tip, and it is this. Do you need a proving drawer or airing cupboard in order to make bread? And the answer is no. It's a little bit unnecessary. Not to say that if you have a proving drawer, you've wasted your money. That's absolutely fine, of course, and I'll get onto that a bit later, but you don't need it. It's not necessary, um, and the reason is, everything I do, I prove at room temperature. The dough and the water is at room temperature already, and I prove on the side of room temperature, and I've made a little video in the past about where you can prove your dough. I'll put a link here somewhere to it, um, where the best place is, and it's normally just out on the side, free of drafts and stuff like that. Here, I'm using a hot cupboard to prove up my hot cross buns. And the reason is, I need control, right? I'm up against a deadline. And you'll see it on the Bake Off in the marquee, and you'll see it all over the place in bakers and whatnot. And the reason is, I need complete control. So if you've got a proving drawer at home, absolutely fine. Use it, bearing in mind, it's probably gonna run at about 28 to 32 degrees or something like that, and it's gonna keep your dough nice and warm. So you're gonna need a warm dough, and you're gonna need it to keep it that temperature through the duration of what you're doing until it goes into the oven. If that makes sense, that's the key, because it's the change in temperature that just messes everything up, not the actual temperature, it's the change. I go to people's houses and host bread making courses, and I never get there and go, oh, where's your airing cupboard? Oh no, we can't make bread, you haven't got one. It doesn't work that way, we leave it out on the side, 18 degrees, 20 degrees, 15 degrees. You know, it, we leave it out on the side and it's absolutely fine, it comes up in time. The key thing is consistency of temperature, not the change in stuff. So by all means, if you've got a proving drawer, use it. 
an airing cupboard, use it. Pop a thermometer in there if you want so you can see exactly what temperature it is at different times of the day probably. I'm sure it's changing all the time. That's the key. So the answer to the question is no. You don't need a proving drawer, air and cupboard to make bread. You can make amazing bread at home without any of those things. And that's it. I'm Jack at Bakewood Jack. We do this every single Thursday. And if you've got a bread making question, send it to me, tweet me, email me, put it in the comments and let me know and I'll get onto it next week. See you then, I better get back to work. Hey home bakers, it's Jack here at bakewithjack.co.uk bringing your weekly bread making tip every single Thursday. And today, I haven't lost my marbles. I'm gonna to talk to you about bread making machines because I get asked about them loads. Somebody tweeted me the other day and I've just done a show at the weekend, a wine festival, and loads of people on me, I say, How do you make bread at home? And they say, mm. they go like this, yeah. And they wince, and they say, yeah, I got a bread making machine. And that's okay. That's okay, that is okay. And so the other day I was asked what are my thoughts on bread making machines. So here they are. Bread making machines are okay. Okay, they're okay. There's one major benefit from a bread making machine, which is you know what you're eating. Yeah, you know what you put in. Chances are it's flour, water, yeast, salt, and probably it's got sugar in it to help to make sure the machine does its job properly and make it brown off nice, probably. Um, but you know what you're eating. In this modern age that we are in, where everything is modern and all the food is made out of modern ingredients, what nobody knows what they are, um, it's quite refreshing to just eat bread made from flour, water, salt, and yeast. Uh, and that's that's a rule for all bread making at home. Um, that's and that's the major benefit. So if somebody winces to me and goes, "Oh yeah, I got bread making machine," at least that's a good thing that you know what you're eating. Uh, bread that comes out of it is okay too. It is your standard loaf, probably. It's probably got some flavours in there in the recipe book that comes with it. I don't know. But there is a bit of a boredom factor probably kick in. And I hear that a lot, that people say, well, yeah, it just makes the same loaf. And then it goes, the machine ends up in a cupboard or whatever at some point. Um, but, you know, my mum has one and she likes it because you put everything in it in the evening. And uh, it's ready for bread in the morning. So, you know, that's pretty wicked if you can do that. And if that works for you, and then you know you're eating and you've got nice fresh bread in the morning that's okay as well. But as I say, this isn't a braid making machine advert. You know, I haven't been sponsored by Philips to make this video um, because they are only okay. Like, of course, I prefer making everything by hand because that's the way. And some people are a little bit surprised when I say, yeah, I'll come to your home and teach you how to make bread, right? Um, they say, oh, uh, do you bring a machine or do it by hand? And I say, well, we do it by hand. Like, we don't just put it in a machine and sit down for three hours with a cup of tea. That's not how it works. We make everything by hand because that's the proper way. Because what is missing out of your bread making machine is this, is this, is love, right? There's no love in a bread making machine. You just put it in and mix up bread done. There's no love here, there's no character, and there's no, you know, and there's so, many, so much little bits and bobs that comes with that, and the texture and the flavour is, is down to love. Of course I would promote making your own bread by hand, of course I would say that, because it is better. Because it is better, but if a bread making machine works for you, that's absolutely fine. One thing to note is that you can do the beginning stages, the mixing and the resting in a bread making machine, take it out and make whatever with it, like, buns or focaccia or I don't know whatever but one thing to know on that is that when everything's proven up inside your machine it's going to be like I don't know 28 32 degrees something like that proving up puffing up and then when you're taking it out you're essentially changing the environment taking it to your room temperature which is like 18 21 something like that and that that will stitch you up as well in time as long as you're aware of that that's okay you need to make allowances for stuff like Mm, cling filming over the top of your proving bread so it doesn't dry out because it's so warm. Stuff like this and you know, don't expect it to rise up. Somebody said to me, um, they make it in a bread making machine, take it out and then when the focaccia rises, it doesn't quite come up as quick or properly or whatever and it's because you're changing the environment and that's a bit of a stitch up too. So, you know, it's always better by hand in my personal humble opinion because that's where the love and the character comes from. 
um, but they are okay and just okay. And you always get a hole in the bottom of a loaf because there's that little mixing thing. I don't know if you've seen it. You get a little mixing thing underneath and it bakes into the loaf and you've got to dig it out and get a hole. It's all a bit odd. There's someone needs to fix that. But that's my thoughts on bread making machines. In a nutshell, they are okay. I don't have one. I probably never will have one. I won't ever have one. I don't have any use for one, uh, but they are okay. You know, I share tips on here regularly and part of what I do when I go to somebody's house or they come to me on a course, on a class, is to put into, it's not a big deal. It is a long process, but the work is minimal. All you really need time for is 20 minutes working and mixing and kneading, and the rest comes as long as you're around. You know, it's not a big deal, and so fitting it into your daily schedule is a lot of what I talk about, because it's a shame you come to a class and go, I mean, you never do it again. It, like, if we can fit it into your day, like we're all busy people, but you can fit it into your day, and there's certain times, like the resting time, you can manipulate and make that longer, whatever, if you've got stuff to do, you can fit it into your schedule that way. And the, of course, this is the way I go because I want to educate people upon on, on how to do it in the first place, what to look out for, and how to fit into your schedule to make sure you can do it. This is what I do, this is my aim. So yeah, bread making machine's okay, but really, there are ways and means of you to fit into your schedule. They're probably not as tricky as you think. And that's it. Listen, we're all on the wind down to Easter now. Uh, I put a couple of hot cross bun recipes on my website. Check it out. Uh, there's a traditional one and there's a chocolate one that I've been working on for a while that I'm quite chuffed with. So go and check that out as well. And if you like this video, if it helped you out, please click that like button so I know exactly uh, what sort of videos to make more of in the future. Happy Easter if you're off. Have a wonderful time. And um, I will see you next week, next Thursday, for another bread making tip. See ya. Hey home bakers, it's Jack here at bakewithjack.co.uk and if you are new here, we do this every single Thursday. I answer a bread making question every single Thursday. Sometimes it's a bit of a chit chat and sometimes it's a practical video, something you can do. Today we're going down the chit chat route because I've had a question from somebody on Facebook from Stephen and he asked me, hey Jack, what's the best type of flour? Good question. <laughs> the best type of flour. Okay, I use two different kinds of flours in my classes. One of them is Dove's Organic. I used to use that a lot. The other one is Allinson flour. And whether it's strong white bread flour or strong white bread flour, it's always going to be different across the different brands. That's just the nature of it, right? And the reason I use, that, use those two types of flour is because they are readily available. You can find them in the supermarket. They're readily available. And what I try and do is to bring you a way of making bread, amazing bread at home and making it readily available, okay? It would make no sense if I imported some flour from Canada that you only got to buy on the internet that's 11 pounds for a bag. It would make no sense because I'm trying to make this accessible for you. So, two types of bread flour that I use, Dove's Organic and Allinson, okay? The Dove's Organic one, they're both completely different. In terms of what's best, it's completely down to your taste, right? That determines what's best. It's whatever you like. And I'll give you an example. The Dove's one makes a real crusty loaf. The crumb texture is quite firm, always and that's the Dove's one. It's a little bit trickier to manipulate along the way but it's fine and if you're making a baguette super thick nice crispy crust easy. Allinson flour strong white bread flour the same Allinson one uh, is slightly different it's really responsive it makes a real nice smooth and supple dough that's really easy to manipulate uh, and it comes together a little bit quickly actually a little bit quicker when you're kneading it. Um, but the final bread is softer in the crumb, uh, a bit lighter, a bit fluffier, and it makes a real thin crust on the outside, so it's a bit tricky to get it well crusty. If you like a big thick crust, you can still get a crunchy thin crust, but you won't get the real thick crust that comes with the dust. So that's the difference between the two that I use. 
Um, that's the difference. So whichever one's best is down to you, depending on whether you like a nice soft loaf, which I make for the kids at home, for the family, or if you want something a little bit firmer, a little bit more robust that makes wicked toast. They both make wicked toast, but a little bit different toast, like even crunchier toast, it's up to you. That's the answer to the question. So another question came through as well on an email uh, from somebody who's saying to me, explaining the texture of a bloomer, explaining the texture of what that comes out, and the way they wanted it to come out and the way that actually did come out, a bit fluffy or a bit dense or a bit whatever, and I said the first thing to check is your type of flour. Change out the type of flour, because that's the biggest thing in your recipe, is the flour. Okay, the water, the yeast, and the salt, fine, but the biggest thing that makes the biggest difference in the recipe, forget the process, is the type of flour you use at the beginning. That will affect the texture the most. So that's it, quick one, yes! Quick one, types of bread flour, types of bread flour, that's not always the same. And sometimes I hear you get a dodgy batch sometimes, it'll respond completely differently even though it's the same brand. So that's that was sparing in the works. But listen, the best type of flour is the one that you prefer the most, the one that makes the bread that you like. And that's it. I'm Jack here at Bake With Jack. We're here every single Thursday with a bread making tip. And if you like this video, uh, let me know, click like, and I'll make some more. And um, yeah, we do this every week, so consider subscribing. If you're on YouTube, you can subscribe on there. And if you're watching this on my website, you can scribe, subscribe on there as well, and it will be in your inbox. So listen, thank you very much for being here. I will see you next week for another one, and that's it. See ya. Hey home bakers, it is Jack here at bakewithjack.co.uk bringing your weekly bread making tip every single Thursday and I'm here sitting on the couch at Avenger Cookery School. I've just finished a bread making class which was wicked. Lovely bread, lovely people. Uh, I made some lunch too which was lovely and um, it was good fun. But listen, I want to talk about recipes, okay? Because a recipe, remember this one thing. A recipe is what somebody did once and it came out okay and they wrote it down, right? That's all a recipe is. You might follow a recipe step by step throughout, but all it is is just what somebody did once and they were quite happy with it and so they wrote it down on a page. I have real trouble writing recipes. It takes me ages. It actually takes me ages um, because I'm trying to get into your head about how you're reading it, about how it comes across, about how obvious it is, and rewriting it, rewriting it, and trying to make it as best as possible. And the reason I do so many videos like this is because I find it hard. Like writing is hard. I find it really difficult. So I just make a video like this, and it's a lot easier for me. And it's all there for you to refer to after, if that makes sense, or during the recipe that you're doing, if that makes sense. Because if I write every single tiny little piece of information down in a recipe, that recipe is gonna be long. It's gonna be massive. It's gonna be a book just for one recipe. Does that make sense? A recipe is just what somebody did once and it came out okay and then they wrote it down. Let me give you an example. I made a fugas. I made two olive fugas for today's class. Now, uh, I didn't have much time yesterday to do the whole process. I wouldn't have had time this morning to do the whole process. I would have had time, but it would have stressed me out a treat before class, which is not cool. So what I did was I made up a dough yesterday, uh, last night. And then what I did was I popped it in my car overnight because the car's nice and cool. Overnight the dough would be fine, ticking over nice and gently, ready for this morning. I come in this morning, I reshape it. I leave it on the side for half an hour or so. I cut it, I shape the food gas, I rest it, I bake it. Job done, right? If I wrote a recipe for that process, it would be crackers. It would be absolutely mad because the recipe would say, eight o'clock, make up your dough, knead it, and all that business, right? Cling film it, walk it out to your car, leave it there on the car seat until the following morning at seven o'clock, and then drive the car for an hour uh, to a said location, and then leave it on the side for a bit while you unpack all your stuff. And then take the dough after you've unpacked your stuff and ball it up. And then leave it on the side while you're doing some other bits and bobs and come back. Do you see what I mean? This recipe is long, yeah? But it's only the way that I did it once that came out okay. Does that make sense? That's not necessarily the best way in the world. It's just the way that I did it to fit in with my life and my schedule today. And it came out okay 
came out really tasty, really nice. Because it would do, because all that time involved. But anyway, had I wrote that into a recipe, it would be probably pretty inconvenient for you. I think that's what I'm getting at. It would be very inconvenient for you. It wouldn't fit in with your life at all. And what you need is a little bit of knowledge of the process so you know what you can do when you can do it. So you know you can pop it into the car overnight and it'll be absolutely fine if you need to. Well, I don't know if you would need to, but you can do that. But So you know the windows of opportunity that you can stretch out the time. Me and my daughter made a loaf of bread the other day. We made three loaves actually. And we made the whole dough together, divided it into three. I left it on the side for a bit. And then you know what we did? We just went out to the park. We went out to the park for like two hours. I came back. You may have seen on my Instagram story. And there was dough everywhere all over the place. But it was fine. We re it up. We put it in the tin. It proved up. We baked it. It was fine because I knew I could get away with that. But if I wrote a recipe for it, it'd be very inconvenient. Walk to the park for two hours, come back, do this, fix the issue. You know what I mean? It just wouldn't make sense for you. So bear that in mind when you're following recipes. Bear in mind, A, who it's written for. If you need a bit more knowledge, maybe you should be reading a, a different book. If you need a bit more explanation, for example. Don't judge a recipe straight off because it's hard to write recipes for people and there are so many ways you can read a sentence and do it slightly differently and interpret it in a slightly different way. Don't judge it completely based on what it is and go, oh, that was a rubbish recipe, it didn't work, right? Because there's so many little nuances that you need to have a little bit of knowledge about. And the third thing, I can't remember what it is. I'm very tired. A recipe is just what somebody did once and they wrote it down because they were quite pleased with it. That's it. It may not be the best way to do it, the best thing in the world, but it worked for them on that day, and it was yummy. And that's it. Listen, if you like these videos, uh, there's a whole database of these videos on my website. Go to bakewithjack.co.uk forward slash videos. And there's about 33, 34 now on there, 40, 35. I don't know, something like that. Go and have a look. Go and get some popcorn in. Uh, have spent the evening in. That sounds like a pretty good evening to me. Binge watch Bake with Jack. If you like this, please click like and let me know so I'll make some more. And that's it. Have a nice Thursday. Whatever day it is when you're watching this, we do this every Thursday. And I'll see you next week. Hey, home bakers, it's Jack here bringing you another bread making tip, which I bring to you every single Thursday. And today is an easy way to make more bread in less time. And here it comes, are you ready? Double up the recipe. <laughs> Seriously though, uh, double the recipe. Double the recipe, one load of work, two loads of bread. Triple the recipe, one load of work, two loaves of bread. And to give you an example, I make three loaves of bread every single week with a recipe that I triple. And so I put it on my website, a little triple loaf recipe, and make three loaves. Make three loaves, bake three loaves, slice one up and eat it, keep one in the cupboard for slicing in a couple of days, and the third one, slice it up and put it into the freezer in a nice baggie. And then you can pop that bag out, leave it on the side overnight and it's ready to go. Or you can take a couple of slices out and make toast in an emergency from the freezer. And that's it. So if you want to have a look at that recipe, go and have a look. It's pretty simple. It's one load of the work and three loads of the bread. Uh, the dough is bigger. Be warned, you're going to need a big bowl. But that's it. I do that once a week, and that sees me through the week. That sees me and the family through the week, as long as I can resist demolishing that first loaf as soon as it's cool enough to eat. Have a look, check it out, and please click like if you like this video. See you next week! Ha! Hey home bakers, it's Jack here at bakewithjack.co.uk bringing your weekly bread making tip every single Thursday and this week I'm going to tell you three things that I've written into a recipe that will stitch you up as a beginner bread maker. Ready? Let's go.
Okay, thing number one that you'll see in a lot of recipe books, and it's something I speak about loads, is the temperature of your water. You'll see in a recipe book, it will say something like, measure out 300 mils of uh, hand hot water, lukewarm water, tepid water, body heat water, blood temperature water, and all this different stuff. And in reality, all that stuff's gonna stitch you up because the last thing you wanna do when you start making bread is stressing out about what sort of temperature the water is. And if it says warm or lukewarm or body heat, it's probably gonna make something that's too warm and it's gonna, you're gonna wanna have a bath in. And that's not the way, okay? The most foolproof way for a beginner baker, which I do in every single one of my classes and demonstrations and courses, is is to use room temperature water that's the same temperature as the air around us okay and I've spoke about that here before but I think it's a really important one because temperature has such a difference on the dough and if you mess that bit up because the instruction is so vague that's a real shame okay so number one for a beginner baker don't do any of that stuff room temperature water and you're well on your way Thing number two that will stitch you up a treat is go and find a warm place to rest your dough. Wowee! This is another one that I spoke about loads and yes, it's another temperature related one because here's the issue, right? If you make everything at room temperature and you rest it in the room at room temperature, it's gonna be there for a few hours over the whole process. The thing that will stitch you up is the change in temperature. Taking it from a warm place to a cold place, taking it from a cold place to a warm place, removing it back out, letting it cool down and stuff like that. The change in temperature will stitch you up. So keep everything the same, simple simples. Less is more if you're a beginner, just leave it out on the side. I do that everywhere I go. Every single house I go to, we use the temperature of the room on the side with great success. Thing number three that will stitch you up, and this is a big one. Knead your dough on a floured surface. Do not knead your dough on a floured surface. Don't knead it on a floured surface. This is another thing that's come up in the past. It's a big one. A lot of people are surprised when I whip the dough straight onto the table and start kneading with zero flour. But here's the deal, okay? When you're kneading, you're stretching the gluten and making the dough stronger, right? And there will be a point where it comes together a bit better, but it might be sticky till the end. The thing you don't want to do is put flour all over the place because you'll put that flour all over it and it will stop sticking to your fingers for a bit and then it becomes sticky and you'll do it again. Right? And all that unworked flour goes into your dough until your dough becomes a nice smooth round ball. And you go, yes, it must be ready, but it's probably not. The reality is you probably put loads of flour into it to stop it sticking from everything. And then you get a real heavy, dense spread that doesn't rise. Stitch up. Don't do it. So that's it. If you're a beginner, there's three things that's going to stitch you up along the way that's written into recipe books. Shocker, I know, and it's so common, and it's so tricky, as I've also said before, to write recipes for other people. It's so tricky. Sometimes these things are put in as a safety measure when actually it's the opposite, uh, it's the opposite result. It stitch you up instead of keeping you safe. So listen, thank you very much. We do this every single Thursday. It's Real Bread Week this week. I don't know if you knew that, and I'm running a special promotion if you're a beginner, if you're in Surrey, Sussex, Hampshire, Berkshire, Kent, and South London, I can come to you and teach you how to make bread. Got 10% off at the minute on a course booking, and I'll give you 50 pounds worth of free bits and bobs to help you keep going after. So you can learn how to make that bread, nail it, and then make it over and over again with great success after I'm gone. I'll put a link here so you can have a little look at that. Thank you very much, and I'll see you next week. Hello bakers, it's Jack here bringing your weekly bread making tip every single Thursday and today I'm in Guildford. This building here is not my house, it's the Guildford Cathedral and this is the grounds which house the wine festival which I'm at today and yesterday which would already pass by the time you see this but it's a wicked event and it's really windy and I hope uh, you can hear me um, it's a really cool event, it's a really good way, opportunity for me to meet the people at Guildford basically, tell them all about who I am and what I do. But today's bread making tip is all about flour, yeah? Strong flour. What is strong flour? Why is it so important and why do we use it for bread, yeah? Basically, strong flour's got a higher protein content than, for example, plain flour. And the amount of protein in the flour directly relates to the amount of gluten that will then develop inside of the dough, right? 
and we spoke about gluten loads. Glo gluten gives the dough the elasticity, the strength, the structure to hold all the air bubbles created by the yeast, yeah? To hold all that gas bubbles and make the dough rise up really nice and big and nice and aerated so we bake it into delicious bread. That's what the gluten does. So it makes sense for us to use a flour high in protein, strong flour, to develop the gluten really nice, to create that elasticity and all the good stuff. Whereas, for example, plain flour that we'd use for cakes or biscuits or pastry or scones, anything you want to be sort of crumbly and have that snap on your pastry, that's what plain flour's for. You don't want the gluten messing everything up for us, making everything chewy and hard and tough. Uh, that's why we use strong flour for bread and plain flour for biscuits and cakes, and that's it. Strong flour equals strong dough. That's why. So listen, thank you very much for joining me this week. This has been your weekly bread making tip. And that's it. Have a lovely week. I'll see you next week. And by the way, if you want to fling any questions my way, you can get hold of me at Bake With Jack on social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. That's a helicopter. It's my time to go. I'll see you next week. Hey, home bakers, it is Jack here back at the Bakewood Jack headquarters. I feel like I haven't been here for ages, sitting up on my dining room table, bringing your weekly bread making tip every single Thursday. Yeah? This week I wanna to talk to you about gluten free. <laughs> gluten free, yes! Gluten free bread, ready? Let's go! Okay, so I'm doing a lot of shows. I go to a lot of shows, food festivals and whatnot and do demonstrations and stuff like that. And the question I get asked the most is, do you do gluten-free bread? And let me take you back to 2015. This is what the answer would have been. Oh, gluten-free. Oh, how unfortunate. I'll tell you what, there is something I'm working on and it won't be long. I'm working hard on gluten-free options. And one day I will give you a call and I'll have a nice gluten-free bread making course ready for you. And that's what I would say, yeah? In 2015, I put your name on a little list. And that's what I would say. However, since then, I spent a lot of time trying to make gluten-free bread. A lot. Fast forward to 2017, and this is what I say when somebody says, hey Jack, do you do gluten-free bread? You ready? No. But listen, here's why, yeah? I'll tell you why. Gluten is in flour. Bread is made out of flour. In fact, the majority of bread, the most ingredient in a bread recipe is flour. That's why bread tastes like bread, because it's made out of flour, yeah? Wheat flour, okay? That's why bread tastes like bread, because most of it is made out of flour. And if the gluten's in the flour, and you want to take the gluten out, you can't just take gluten out of flour. It's not just like decaffeinating coffee, where you take the caffeine out of the coffee bean, and it's all cool, it's still a bean. It's not like that, it can't be done. I don't think it can be done anyway. Nobody does it. Maybe it can be done. Maybe I need to do it. So listen, if the gluten's in the flour, you take the flour out of the recipe and what you're left with, water, yeast, and salt. Can't really make bread with that. So you've got to replace the flour with something or anything, literally anything. And every time I talk about gluten-free bread to people, I say it's like this. It's a little bit like making an omelet without using eggs. You've got to find something with the characteristics of an egg, with the texture and the flavour and all the properties that come with an egg, that is not an egg. And my friends, you can't make an omelette without cracking an egg, you know what I mean? And so you can't really make bread that tastes like bread and looks like bread. That's bread. That's not got wheat flour in it, because wheat flour is a big thing, okay? And you might say to me, well, why don't you just use gluten-free flour? I'll tell you why, because gluten-free flour is not actually flour, it's a blend of stuff. It might have rice in it, potato starch, tapioca, teff flour, sorghum, all this weird stuff. Not weird stuff, just other stuff that is not wheat. So it will never taste like bread. So I did a lot of trials. I spent a long time trying to make gluten-free bread, replacing it with stuff, reading loads of books, spending money on different ingredients from all over the globe. And I could make something that looks like a baguette, but it never tastes like a baguette. It don't break and rip like a baguette. Because the gluten is essential. And that's where my heart is. My heart is in the gluten. 
every time I take a nice fresh baguette out of the oven, I want to eat it immediately. Every time I took a gluten-free bread out of the oven, I winced as I put it into my mouth, like, oh no, what's it going to be like? And I'm sorry, listen, if you're gluten-free out there, you're probably not watching my video. If you're gluten-free out there, I'm sorry, it must be horrible for you, it's a shame. But I'm sorry, the answer is no. It's not what it used to be. I spent a lot of time and effort. I tried very hard, but I was never proud of it. And it would be wrong for me to come into your house and teach you how to make something that I'm not proud of and take it out of the oven and go, oh, lovely. Because it ain't, it wasn't, I'm sorry. It would not be the right thing to do. My heart's not there, and therefore, I cannot do it. I'm sorry. One day somebody's gonna do it and they're gonna absolutely change your lives. But my heart is in the wheat and the gluten and all the good stuff that comes with it. And that's it. Listen, if you wanna come and see me at an event this year, I'm doing loads all over Surrey. So I'll put a link here and you can come and click on it. Come and see where I'm at. Come and say hello. The majority of them I've got demos at. Some of them I've got a stall at, I'll be here all day for a chat. So please come and say hey, and let me answer your questions. And if you are gluten free, I'm sorry, it's not me, but it's out there. Somebody will find it and create it one day, it's gonna be unbelievable. But until then, it's not me. For all your bread needs, wheat flour, bread, full 100% gluten needs, come and find me at an event, click the link. See you next week. Hey home bakers, it's Jack here in a bush. I'm at the Surrey County Show, and uh, if you follow me on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, you'll know that I've been doing three shows in a row, uh, four demonstrations, and I've just done the last one. And now it's, I'm a little bit tired, so apologies. I wanted to bring your weekly bread making tip from here straight away because I had a chat with a guy today about knocking back dough, right? Knocking back dough. He said, I don't know if I knock it back enough or too much and stuff like this, and this is what I said to him. You can knock back your dough as much as you like. When you're shaping up a loaf, it's about the tension. And I spoke about it before on my shaping up a loaf video. Um, it's about the tension. You've got to build tension, right? So after your dough's rised up on its own uh, for the first rise, and you knock it back down, you can knock it right back down like crazy. And then, in your final bread, when the crumb rises, it will become more consistent inside in terms of like bubble structure, I suppose. Or, you can do it nice and gently, and then ball it up and shape it up. Make sure it's really, really tight anyway. You build the tension, but without degassing it too much, and then you retain some of the character. You're re-strengthening the dough, making it tight, building the tension again, but you're not losing the character inside. You're not losing the gas, you're not losing those big bubbles that have developed. And that's the way that I like to do it. It's a little bit more risky that way. You're a bit more at risk of getting like a big giant hole up here from somewhere, but actually I quite like all that. So the rule is, if you want a nice fine crumb and bubble structure, smash it right back down if you want to do it that way. And if you don't, if you like to maintain the character, the big bubbles and the small bubbles and the big bubbles and the small bubbles, just take it a little bit easy. Use fingertips. But whatever you do, make sure you build that tension when you're shaping it up. Make sure you build the tension to hold the shape of the dough to make it come up nice and proud on the second rise before you bake it. And that is it. If you want to see anything about the shows that I've been at, I've made a little video for each and I've stuck it on YouTube and Facebook and it's on the website as well, so go and have a look at it there. Uh, and thank you very much for joining me every Thursday. And if you're the one of the people that came to see me, thank you very much for coming to see me this weekend. It has been wicked. But now I'm absolutely pooped out. Uh, and nearly time to pack away and go. So I'm gonna sit in this bush for another five minutes and then I'm gonna crack on. Thank you very much. See you later. Hey home bakers, it's Jack here, bakewithjack.co.uk and we are back! Yeah! Season two of the weekly bread making tip. Let's go! So if you are hanging around since season one, let's call it season one, it sounds wicked, doesn't it? If you've been hanging around since season one while I've been on this content break, which actually lasted for ages, 
Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm back now. I think this is episode number 39. Let's go for it. And this one, I want to talk about overcomplicating recipes and I'll tell you why. I get a lot of emails about bread from you guys, which is awesome, by the way. Keep doing it. Um, and one from a lady called Cecilia. Now, Cecilia was trying to get in touch with me for a while um, over across many different platforms and um, uh, she was making bread at home and wondered why it wasn't getting enough oven spring in the oven. So I said, hey Cecilia, uh, let's get down to it. Send me the recipe, I don't know what's going on. So you send me the recipe and we can figure this out. She sent me some photos, she sent me the recipe and that's where the problem was. So lack of oven spring can be many, many things and this is the tricky thing with bread. Uh, that's why I make so many videos like this because one small error can be caused by many things and it's really hard to pinpoint that thing without actually seeing what you're doing. Uh, reading the recipe of what you're doing is part of the puzzle and the rest of it is the nature, is there's a bigger game at play here and it's the way that you're handling it, the way that you're kneading it and all this other stuff. But the point is the recipe was long. It had about a million steps to it, right? There was a pre-ferment left overnight for 10 hours that we've spoken about that before, it's wicked, right? There was a bulk ferment of two hours with a fold every 30 minutes. There was a fruit addition towards the end of the bulk ferment about an hour into the process. Before all of this Happened, there was a 20 minute autolyzed process before anything got mixed up anyway and there was an old reserve bit of dough from yesterday which was a really really nice thing to do with improved flavor and the texture but the point is there's too many stages the whole thing is over complicated and so for me to dissect at which point the oven spring issue happened is really really hard all those things are good things. The auto lies is a good thing. The Polish pre, the Polish pre ferment is a good thing. The reserve dough from yesterday is a good thing. But don't do them all together because it confuses the whole situation. And that's like, well, I don't know, 15, 16 hours into the game, you got a loaf of bread that you're not happy with. That's enough to put anybody off. And I'm so uh, surprised that Cecilia was persistent and she kept going because I feel like a lot of people would have given up way before that even happened. But the point I'm trying to make in this video is to keep things simple, right? Start off simple simples. Yes, all those things are good things and you can introduce one. For example, the pre ferment I spoke about before. Uh, find a recipe, there's recipes on my website, simple, simple recipes and once you've got that down, introduce a pre ferment. Once you've got that down, do a try and autolyze next time. See how you get on because all the different steps in one go is way too complicated and it's stressing me out even thinking about that even happening. And then the bread to be a disappointment at the end. Keep everything simple. The, the point I'm trying to make in these videos is just that little bit of information. So one of those things will make that penny drop and you go, that's why it doesn't rise up properly because I put flour down. Or that's why this, or this is what I can do to make it better. But don't do everything at once. It's way too stressful. It's really cool to try new things. It's really cool to get new steps in there and new things on the go, but not all at the same time. Time. Listen, I hope this video, the first one of the season, has been of help to you, um, all of you out there, not just Cecilia. And listen, thank you very much for hanging out with me on here today. I'm Jack from bakewithjack.co.uk. Recipes and more videos like this on my website. And that's it. Thank you very much. Hey your home bakers, it's Jack here at bakewithjack.co.uk, bringing you your weekly bread making tip every single Thursday. This week is a very common one, and it was sent in by Andrew on Facebook, who says, hey, how come my loaves are bursting underneath? And Andrew's talking about a freestanding loaf that you prove up on a tray, and you pop it into the oven, and it bursts underneath. It ruptures during the baking process. And here's the answer, right? Bread dough will always rupture where it's weakest. If a dough is proving on a tray, it's going to create a skin on the top, a fine skin, and that's okay. It keeps the shape really nice as long as it's not a super thick skin. Where it's touching the tray, that is where you get a moist area, and the moisture leads to weakness. So when the bread goes in the oven, you get oven spring, which is this. And when that oven spring happens, the outside of the crust sets the shape of the loaf and there's pressure inside ready to rupture out somewhere, okay? That's gonna rupture out at a weakest point, which normally is the point where the loaf is touching the tray. It bursts underneath, rupture, and you get that big bubble coming out like that, which is not what 
you want. So the idea with slashing is that you're creating a deliberate weak spot. You're slashing it with a blade on top, creating a weak spot so if it's gonna burst, which hopefully it does because it looks quite attractive, it's gonna burst in that weakened spot. So the answer is, have a little work on your grignette technique. Make sure you're slicing it at an angle. One more thing that it could be, it could just simply be that your loaf is very, very slightly underproved. And when it's underproved and slightly tight, it's going to bake, and then there's going to be all that tension and pressure inside that will burst out then underneath. And that's it. I hope this video tip helps you out. It's nice to be back in the game. Uh, if you're new here, my name is Jack, and I'm here at bakewithjack.co.uk. Click subscribe if you fancy it. I'm going to do this every single Thursday. I'm going to do my very best to get this out every single Thursday, and I hope that happens. So click subscribe if you don't want to miss next week. And that's it. Peace out. Thank you very much. Hey, your home bakers, it's Jack here at bakewithjack.co.uk, bringing you your weekly bread making tip every single Thursday. And today, I'm going to talk about the size of your ears. Hello and welcome back to another weekly bread tip. We do this every single Thursday and if you're new here, I have a chat about a lot of things and every once in a while there's a little practical video as well to help you out. So consider pressing that subscribe button if you fancy. Now, listen, uh, obviously in the beginning, I wasn't talking about the size of your ears. I'm talking about the size of an ear on a loaf of bread. And this is what I'm talking about. This is what I'm talking about when I say ear. It's this lovely bit that opens up, okay? That lovely bit there, and it's quite tricky to achieve, right? But it can be done in your oven at home. This one was done in my oven at home. Sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't. And let's get down to the six factors that contribute to that happening. And the first thing I want to talk about is tension. Now, you'll know, if you know me, if you're familiar with me and what I do here, you'll know I talk a lot about building tension. And you can see more about it. There's a couple more videos. One is called something like how to stop your loaf from spreading out flat, and the other one's how to shape a loaf of bread. But the thing about tension, you've got to build that tension across the top of the loaf. Across the top of the loaf, make it really nice and tight when you're shaping technique. And you can build tension when you shape it the first time, and you can let it rest an hour and build some more tension, let it rust up again. And that's a really cool thing to do because you're just building more and more tension. That makes it nice and tight across the top. And when you slash it, it opens out on the top really beautifully. But that's not the only thing. The second factor is catching it just the right time of it's proving up. If it's slightly overproved, although it's still holding its shape, it's getting a little bit delicate, it's gonna lack that real push in the oven. We're talking about oven spring I talked about last week. It's that puff. It's that big puff up like that that goes when you go into the oven uh, and it's got to have just the right amount of tension for that to happen. That means perhaps bake it slightly earlier than you would do your standard loaf in a tin. So it retains a little bit of that bounce and a little bit of that tension inside and a little bit of that force when it goes into the oven to create that big massive burst on top. Factor number three is, what are you slicing it with? What are you slashing or scoring the top of your dough with? Is it a knife? Is it a serrated knife? Is it a sharp knife? Or is it one of these little chappies? This is a grignette. And I've spoken about this before, but it's super duper sharp. You've got to have something really sharp. And a lot of recipes will say, slash it with a razor or a sharp knife, right? To make it easy for people who don't have one of these, to make it accessible and that's okay. But your sharp knife has really got to be as sharp as a razor blade. It's got to be properly, properly sharp. Your, your cook's knife that you're using at home and stuff like that is probably not going to do the job as well. This creates a real swift, sharp, super razor sharp slice in the top. And that's what you need as well. And then, once you have one of these, factor number four is your slashing technique. Now, to get this to open up nicely, if you see where I sliced it in the loaf, I didn't, it opened up almost to the middle, but I only slashed it to here, right? Which is just a little bit on the diagonal of that dome in the first place. And when I slashed it, I went in at a shallow angle like this, okay? Like that. I didn't slash it like that. A real shallow angle like a spoon, like I'm scooping out with a spoon like this. And that creates a little bit of a, almost like a flap over, and that's the bit that opens up and turns into that massive ear. 
Factor number five is also something to do with oven spring. You want maximum oven spring when you go into the oven and the best way to achieve that is to bake on top of something hot. Your dough gets straight onto something hot, hits that heat and conducts that heat straight away, maximum oven spring. That thing that is hot inside of your oven can be a baking stone. You may have seen a pizza stone in the past or a rectangular baking stone that goes into the oven. I've got a big lump of granite sitting into my oven that I put all my dough directly onto. I slide it directly onto that hot piece of granite and get maximum oven spring. You may have seen a Dutch oven technique which we'll talk about in the future as well. Dutch oven is a big, uh, big massive cast iron pan essentially, a deep one with a lid and you heat it up in the oven real nice, pop your dough inside and it comes up really, really nice. So bake on something hot. The final factor that contributes to that beautiful ear is steam. Now I've spoken about steam before as well. Steam gives your dough time to open up because it makes everything softer for longer. For example, when your, when your loaf goes into the oven, it sets its shape on the outside and then it stops growing any further. With the steam, it will keep opening, 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 opening up. Uh, more and more and more, the more steam you can get into your oven. So there you have it. That's why that question is not so easy to answer. At the end of a class, when somebody says to me, hey, how come yours has come up? You've got a nice ear on top of yours like this, and mine has not happened yet. It's down to those six Things. The first thing is your shaping technique and building that tension across the top. The second thing is catching it at just the right point before you put it into the oven. The third thing is what you're slashing your dough with. Make sure you've got some sort of grin yet, something super, super duper sharp. Number four was slashing technique. Nice, shallow angle, nice and swiftly. Number five, we're in the <laughs> number five is baking it on something hot, hot stone Dutch oven, something like that. And number six is steam. Create a nice steamy environment. That's why it's not so easy to achieve. And once you get it at home, that's a wicked moment. And you feel free to have a little happy dance around your kitchen when that happens. Because when it does happen, it's awesome. And once you get that inside of your head, what you're waiting for, what you're looking for, at what point you want to slash it and where and when, you will have it down to a T over and over again. And it's such a good moment. When that ear pops up, celebrate because you deserve it, yeah? And that's it. Hey, thank you so much for watching this video. I try and do this every single week just to bring you some little bit of advice that might help you out on your quest to make an amazing bread at home. Uh, if you like this video, if it helps you out, please click like and share it out. That would be amazing. And if you want to come and bake with me in person, or if you think that might be a nice gift for somebody, I'm here in Surrey in the south of England. Come and say, hey, come and bake some bread with me. And the link is underneath if you're on YouTube or have a look around the website if that's where you are. See you next week. Hey home bakers, it's Jack here at bakewithjack.co.uk bringing you your weekly bread making tip every single Thursday. And today I wanna to talk to you all about baker's percentages. Let's go. Hey everybody, thanks for hanging out with me here today. If you are brand spanking new, then welcome to my channel, or welcome to the world of Bake With Jack, where I try and help people make amazing bread every single week in these little tidbit videos of help. So without further ado, a baker's percentage is quite a nice thing to know about when you start going off piste and start making your own recipes and experimenting a little bit with flowers and moisture content and stuff like that. It's a really helpful thing to know about. It does require a little bit of mathematics, but it will really help you out. So I'm not a baker, right? I've never been a baker. I've never worked in a baker shop, but what I do have is four and a half years experience making bread in other people's houses and I've had a lot of experience in my chefing career making bread and putting it into my work for the last uh, 10 years. <laughs> Once you start looking at recipes from a baker's percentage point of view, it's really, really handy to come up with your own recipes. And this is how it works, okay? Everything is compared to the quantity of flour in the recipe. 
For example, let's start off with a nice easy number, a thousand grams of flour. Now that's a kilo by the way. A thousand grams of flour is a kilo of flour. So that is a hundred percent. Everything else is compared to that a hundred percent. For example, if your recipe said 1,000 grams of flour, 700 grams of water, that means the water is 70%. I know it's not 70% of the recipe as a whole, but it's in relation to the quantity of flour. So with your water at 700 grams and your flour at 1,000 grams, we can say it's got a 70% hydration rate, which is quite a nice thing to say, isn't it? It makes me feel all professional. But that makes it a little bit easy to compare to other recipes. And it's the same with everything else. For example, salt, 1,000 grams of flour, uh, 20 grams of salt is a baker's percentage <laughs> of... <laughs> Um, 20 out of 1,000 times 100. 102? No. 2%. Yeah. <laughs> 2. 2% 2 uh, salt. And everything else you'd put up against the flour. I find this really, really helpful when I'm designing new bread making courses because I might need a dough to make donuts, for example, that I did recently, and I need 375 grams of flour. And that size dough makes enough donuts for the class without having to make a big, massive dough, 75 donuts and get them all through the deep fryer. In that case, if I need a 375 grams of flour dough, I can find a recipe for a 500 grams of flour dough, work out what the baker's percentage is of moisture, milk, eggs, etc., sugar, everything else, work out what the percentage is, and then scale it down to that 375 flour figure. But with all that fact in mind, all those baker's percentages, it leaves you free to scale up a recipe, to scale down a recipe in different proportions, to compare a recipe of Mr. Paul Hollywood to a recipe of Mr. Richard Bertinet, to discover the differences and why Mr. Richards are really, really wet and really pliable and stretchy in the dough and Mr. Paul Hollywood's a little bit more accessible for the home baker because there's probably a smaller moisture content uh, hydration rate. So listen, thank you very much for hanging out with me today. I thought that might be a little bit of something a little bit interesting, a little bit more advanced, but it certainly helps out when you're tackling your own recipes, you're making sourdoughs, or if you want to compare one recipe to another and figure out what went wrong or why it's different or why the dough's more supple and elastic and things like that's a little bit helpful, a little bit interesting insight for you. So thank you very much. If this has helped you out, please click the like button if you're on YouTube or just share it out to your mates and pals. That'll be awesome. I look forward to seeing you next week for another weekly bread making tip. And that's it. Bye-bye. Hey home bakers, it's Jack here at bakewithjack.co.uk bringing you your weekly bread making tip every single Thursday. And this week I want to share with you two ways to make bread that lasts longer. Not two ways to make your bread last longer. Hmm. Hey everybody, thanks so much for tuning in to your weekly bread making tip today. If you're new here and you're watching on YouTube, consider subscribing because I try and pop a little bit of information to help you out on your quest to amazing bread every single Thursday. Now homemade bread is amazing, right? But people say to me, hey Jack, but it doesn't last very long. How do you keep it? And I've done a little video on how you keep your bread after you've made it to ensure that it lasts longer. Today I want to talk about two things you can do to your bread dough to make actual bread with a longer shelf life, yeah? So the first thing you can do is introduce a little bit of fat of some description, okay? Don't wince, I'm talking about a little bit of butter inside of the dough or a little bit of olive oil inside of the dough or something like that. Rapeseed oil is nice as well and it's a little bit yellow, but I'm talking about like 25 grams of butter, for example, in a 500 gram flour recipe for a loaf of bread will help it keep for longer because the fat makes everything softer inside. And the way I think about it in my head is that water evaporates and so moisture evaporates out of your dough out of your finished loaf of bread the whole time making it 
stale, right? Dry, harder, and stale. However, butter doesn't evaporate. It's a fat, keeps everything nice and softer for longer. The second thing that you can do is all down to that magical ingredient, time. Oh my goodness, Jack's talking about time again. Change the record. Yeah, but time is so important, right? And if you extend the time that your dough rests before you bake it, it will absorb more of that moisture and the finished loaf will retain more of that moisture for longer, letting it dry out slower. Does that make sense? <laughs> so introduce a little bit of extra time into your dough, whether you're resting it as a whole for longer, whether you're making some sort of pre-ferment sponge, poolish beagle or something like that I've spoken about in another video before, that rests overnight or for a few hours before you make it or something like that, whether you're doing an autolyze, which is basically mixing up all your ingredients and leaving it for 20 minutes, 30 minutes to absorb that moisture before you need it, something to introduce extra time into your dough will make a loaf of bread that lasts longer. So hey, thank you so much for hanging out with me on here today. I hope this tip has proved helpful for you uh, and your future of creating amazing bread at home. Uh, we put a lot of effort into our homemade bread at home and it's nice to have a few little sneaky tips I thought I'd share with you to make them keep well for longer. Not that I ever have that problem because I eat it so fast. And that's it. If this video has helped you out, please share it out to all your bread making pals. That would be super helpful. See you next week. Hey home bakers, it's Jack here, bakerwithjack.co.uk, uh, bringing you your weekly bread making tip every single Thursday. And recently, I've been putting a little tiny touch of rye flour into my breads at home, uh, and I'm gonna tell you why. Let's go. Hey everybody, welcome back. It's me, it's Jack here, Bake With Jack. I wanna talk to you about rye flour today because it is Wicked, and I've been using it a lot recently, but first, let's have a word from our sponsors. Oh, hey, it's me. Yeah, I'm the sponsor for this video. <laughs> hey, that was good, wasn't it? Was that good? Not really. You can come and bake bread with me in person if you want to. If you're in the south of England, I'm here in Surrey, and I travel to people's houses in Surrey, Kent, Sussex, Berkshire, Hampshire, and the south of London, bringing the joy of homemade bread. I can come to you and host a course inside of your house, or you can come to me, because I host them in Woking, in Surrey. I'll put the links underneath if you want to come and hang out with me for the day and bake some wicked breads together. That will be awesome. Let's get back to your bread making tip. So a little bit of rye flour goes a long way when you're making bread at home. Recently I've been making a lot of loaves of bread with strong white bread flour and a small percentage of wholemeal rye flour. Typically 20% or even 30% of rye flour. And I'm not talking about baker's percentages, what I talked about last week. This is all getting very confusing. I'm talking about the percentage of flour. For example, 500 grams of flour in total, made up of 400 grams of strong white bread flour and 100 grams of rye flour. That's 20% of the flour content is rye. And this is the one I've been using, it's Dove's wholemeal rye flour. I've only got a little bit left, I need to pop out and get some more. But any wholemeal stone ground rye flour works really, really well. And this one here, I've got it in a little bowl to show you. Can you see it? It's a little bit, it's very, very heavy flour. It's got lots of bits and bobs in there and it's almost gray in its appearance and it smells really yummy. It brings like, I try, I, I try hard to describe what flavors are like, but I find that really, really tricky. And if you have a whole 100% wholemeal rye flour loaf, uh, you know what I'm talking about. It's quite heavy and it tastes a little bit like Bran flakes. In fact, it tastes a lot like bran flakes, and I like bran flakes, so that's a good way to go for me. It's really hearty, it's full of goodness, and it feels like you're eating something good. But when you take a little bit of rye flour and put it into a regular loaf of bread recipe, it has the following effects. It's gonna make your dough super sticky, okay? I'm not talking sticky like a wet dough sticky, I'm talking about glue. Gluey, properly gluey. It's gonna glue itself to your hands. It's gonna glue itself to the table at the beginning of the kneading process, but keep working through that glue and it will come together really nicely. 
it brings a really nice whole mealy, something a little bit better than wholemeal. If you imagine a white bread with a little bit of wholemeal in like my cob loaf recipe you can find on the blog, it's a little bit like that except it's got some more beautiful brown flaky undertones to it that makes it really really moorish and really delicious. And another thing it brings is a little bit of extra moisture. I feel like it holds the moisture a little bit better, make it for a nice, softer, uh, crumb texture, which is really delicious. And the crust on the outside, it goes properly golden, and that's where you get maximum flavor in the crust, always, right? So that's what really celebrates the flavor of that rye. There you go, give it a try. Give a little rye a try in your next loaf of bread. If you are using the cob loaf recipe off my website, just swap that whole meal out. I think there's 100 grams of whole meal in there. Just swap that whole meal out for rye and see how you get on. See how you like the change in texture and the change in flavor because I'm really, I'm really, really enjoying it uh, at the moment. So much so that I've just started a rye sourdough starter to see how I get on with that. And that's it for today's tip. So hey, thank you very much for hanging out with me today. If you are new, please consider pressing that subscribe subscribe button and you won't miss out on my tips every single week and if you're watching this on the website hey thanks so much for coming and hanging out on my website there's loads of resources on there I'm trying to make it a really big resource of recipes and videos and helpful stuff as well as where you can book on to my lovely bread making courses and workshops so once again thank you very much I look forward to seeing you next week for another bread making tip take care have a nice week and I'll see you soon